Okay, so uh, today's event is Dialogue is Building New Social Worlds. We have with us uh, Dr. Muli Peleg, who's not only a, a well-respected academic, but he's also a friend of Roots and a, a friend of mine. I think we met three years ago in New York, perhaps it was three and a half, even four, who knows who's counting. Uh, Muli invited Root speakers to speak on his campus in the US. I think that was at Fordham. Fordham, uh, two, yes. Fordham two years ago. And uh, Muli also spoke, I guess, two years ago, minus a month, at a Roots uh, iftar, a uh, breakfast with, uh, at the end of the day during the Muslim month of Ramadan when the Muslims are fasting. I think we had like 60 or 70 people there, uh, Jews and, and Muslims, perhaps a smattering of Christians. And we heard Muli speak a little bit there. Uh, but we want to hear more, much more. I'll just tell everyone that unfortunately, we have another Roots event, another 20 minutes, which I have to get off the call for. So Shoal uh, is here to uh, make sure things run smoothly and uh, moderate. So I just wanna read part, a small part of Muli's biography. He's now just recently appointed to be the director of the International School at Oranim College in the North of Israel. He's a political sociologist whose areas of expertise are conflict resolution, peace building, and social sustainability. He's taught at Columbia and Fordham universities in the US. His research focuses on in, intercultural and interfaith dialogue in deeply divided communities. And there's a long list of books he wrote here. I'm not gonna read the whole list of books, uh, but I assume they're worth reading. So Muli, it's all yours. Thank you very much for being us today. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure of, uh, you know, being here today with you folks. And uh, as Hanan mentioned, uh, we met, um, I think, uh, 2019, one of your rounds, uh, fundra fundraising round, and it was um, dinner with um, friends of ours, and immediately we hit it off. And um, I am, uh, alongside with my academic career, uh, I am a long time uh, activist of social justice and peace in Israel. And uh, when he told me about Roots, I was really uh, elated because uh, for many years, I was a part of uh, initiatives, uh, projects that uh, the direction uh, of most of them was uh, top bottom uh, with um, certain uh, members of uh, governments, diplomats, and so on and so forth. But uh, I reached the conclusion that uh, the more uh, uh, effective, uh, the more efficient uh, direction for uh, reaching out to the other uh, conflict management uh, and bringing uh, more sanity to our afflicted region uh, would be uh, bottom up rather than top bottom. Um, and and uh, bottom up means uh, people on the ground really uh, reaching out to one another, getting to know one another, trying to uh, not to uh, um, eliminate, but to bring down to lower the uh, psychological barriers uh, that stand between them. And when um, Anan told me about his acquaintance with his neighbor, and then that they were not aware of each other, even though the, the geographical proximity, that was exactly the model that I was looking for to bring together models and theory with actual people on the ground. And, and I believe that something that grows, that is cultivated from actual needs on the ground is much more germane, authentic, um, and therefore has much more prospects of, uh, of survivability, of sustainability, uh, rather than shifting interests of policymakers or uh, you know, self-redeemed profits. Um, this is much more genuine and it immediately uh, captured my uh, attention and my interest and we started collaborating. Um, and, and, and this brings me to what I want to uh, share with you today, because I've been um, in this uh, craft of uh, dialogue, of uh, bringing together opposites in order to create a new future, which uh, benefits all sides. I've been in this um, since my university days. I uh, 
my BA was from the Hebrew University uh, in the late 80s, uh, tumultuous times in Israel. Scratch that. There are always tumultuous times in Israel, but the latter half of the 80s, uh, there were lots of demonstrations, um, violence on the streets, um, and they really scratched me. And um, uh, I had a vivid memory of those days. These were my forming years. Um, that was right after my military service, and uh, I uh, I was really committed to. Uh, try to understand the other, other with a capital O. And I, I became aware of the othering processes and dynamics. Um, so um, uh, on both with parallel path, I started um, uh, studying uh, my uh, areas of expertise became radicalism, extremism, political violence, and then what to do with it. This is diagnosis and prognosis. Now that you know that those uh, uh, elements are uh, out there, what do you do with it? And that led me to conflict management and to dialogue. And so I wanna share with you some of the things that I've studied and then researched and then wrote about and then also uh, participated in trying to implement them. So I'm gonna share my screen now with you guys. Can you see that? Yes. Go to presentation mode. Okay, so I want to start with some of the uh, activism side of the equation. And these are some of the opportunities and occasions that I was fortunate to participate. Uh, some of the people you may know, um, uh, I was in Amman for several rounds of talks with Palestinians with the mediation of the Jordanians and Prince Hassan is in the middle of the picture there. Work with Amnesty International as well. I had some uh, interesting rounds of uh, talks and dialogue with uh, Shiites in uh, some sensitive areas and also with uh, the Japanese government and this uh, minister, deputy minister was in charge of uh, looking for uh, Israeli soldiers missing in actions in Lebanon. And uh, we had some interesting uh, experience there as well. Some of the uh, people, the dignitaries that I got to know, some of them became uh, close friends of mine and I am of there. Um, Yossi Balin at the top left there, the mastermind of the Oslo, uh, the uh, agreements, Jason Alexander, who uh, uh, was one of the founders uh, of the uh, One Voice movement, Laurie Anderson there down on the right uh, bottom. Um, she is a, a wonderful singer and composer and uh, a human rights activist from New York. And of course, Martin Luther King III, uh, which I brought him to Israel several times. We did some inter interesting things, again, between Israelis and Palestinians and between uh, Jews and Arabs within Israel. And of course, in between my activities, uh, I go back to my cocoon, to my uh, university, uh, where I try to spread the word of uh, dialogue, the benefits of dialogue, uh, some of my classes there. And ultimately, uh, some of the projects that we did on the ground. Um, we've been to several places, uh, some uh, problematic sensitive places, um, you know, multi-rifted societies in, in several continents, but these are the two that I take the, the most uh, pride. Ramle, when we did a project between Jews and Arabs in this, in this fascinating town and also in Zanzibar where we had a major problem between uh, the Tanzanians and the, and the Zanzibarians. I'm not gonna get into this, but uh, whoever is interested in this, I published a chapter uh, with regard to what we did there. And again, that was sponsored by uh, the American government uh, during uh, the Obama administration. And again, we tried uh, the new 
uh, form of dialogue that I'm promoting in, in uh, Oranim as well, which is called CMM. I'm going to touch upon it uh, very soon. So we have to find out what is the concept, what is the meaning of dialogue. And we have to do that because uh, there is a lot of misconception, misinterpretation about what dialogue is. And in order to understand what dialogue is, I would like uh, to start a short and brief journey with you. Um, and together we'll, we'll, we'll try to understand what dialogue means. So dialogue, the context for dialogue is really conflict or misunderstanding or, or lack of communications. Had everything uh, been okay, there would not be a need for dialogue. Um, so one of the most uh, prevalent uh, and most familiar um, um, theory of, of conflict is the structure of conflict. And uh, the uh, gist of it is the conflict triangle that every conflict, every conflict in the household, um, in, in your neighborhood, in the education system, between countries, between civilizations, has three components to it. The situation or the context of the background that uh, gave birth to this conflict. And then the attitude of uh, each side to the other. Uh, usually a demeaning um, attitude, uh, vilifying and trying to uh, bring down the other side. And that leads to behavior, all kinds of uh, behavior during conflict. So this is the conflict triangle and how it leads us to dialogue through conflict management. Conflict management is not a necessity. Um, we don't have to go into conflict management. Only if you feel that the conflict does not serve you, you continue to conflict management. And I say conflict management rather than conflict resolution. Conflict resolution is, I think, in my opinion, too presumptuous. Conflict is pretty imminent uh, and is with us because people are different. The variance creates the conflict. And the question and most of the effort should be focused on how to cope or how to grapple with the conflict and not try to eliminate it. And therefore I think conflict management is more accurate and more feasible and doable than conflict resolution. So managing conflict is really, what is the management? The management is to, uh, try to move or to shift conflict from destructive to constructive. And how do we do that? Well, we go back to the triangle. This is why I started with a triangle, changing the component of the triangle. What does it mean? Well, we have to uh, push the behavior of conflict to being more tolerant, more empathetic, more restrained. The attitude, the other axis, from enemy to partner, the image of the other should be shifted from our enemy or our menace or our challenge to our partner. And the situation that yielded the conflict, we should identify, we should detect the circumstances that brought this conflict to begin with and change them, amendment, amend them so that the direction would be conflict management and a new reality. And for all these components, the most important thing is communication with the other. And here we usher in the concept of dialogue. All those things seem reasonable, rational, but they are very difficult to obtain. They are very difficult to come by. Uh, because for example, when we are upset and we are angry, and the conflict is continuing and ongoing, we fall back on the behavior which is not empathetic, unrestrained and intolerant. And we need an image of, of the other as an enemy to justify our mobilization and our zeal. And then we justify our zeal by pointing out all kinds of uh, circumstances in the situation that merit our attitude and behavior. So it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And therefore we get used to it very quickly and hence it's very difficult to get out of it and shift it. But the key is communication with the other. 
Now, when we talk about communication patterns, there are really grosso modo two paths here, indirect talks and direct talks. Indirect is really third side and we uh, turn to indirect talks when we cannot communicate directly because there is animosity and suspicion and hatred, lots of uh, walls that are being built during conflict. And there are different types of uh, indirect talks. Uh, you're probably familiar with them, facilitation, mediation, arbitration, and more. These are the three more prominent ones. And the difference between them is the amount of power and discretion that the third side exercises. And again, I'm not gonna delve into this, but if you have specific question, please don't hesitate to ask me because I wanna focus on the direct talks and the direct talks are negotiation and dialogue. So here we zero in on where dialogue is awaiting for us. So many people, many folks uh, out there uh, think that negotiation and dialogue are the same thing. Well, they are not more than this. They are opposites of each other. Why? In what way? Well, let's see what is not dialogue. And I have to specify it because there, as I said before, a lot of misconception and misinterpretation about dialogue and people use it loosely and freely. And many of them just don't use it correctly. And most of the policymakers don't use it correctly, which is sad and painful. So what isn't a dialogue? Well, as you see here, hostility, disrespect, and delegitimation of the other has no place in dialogue. A focus on symptoms, procedures, and technicalities is not the dialogue. Vindictive, preconceived notions, generalizations in dialogue, they are left out of the room. An opportunity for confrontation, clash of narratives, again, that's not narrative, that's not dialogue. Investing in persuasion. That's the key for negotiation. What we're talking about here is negotiation and negotiation is the opposite of dialogue because dialogue is characterized by these features. And you see every, every one of those features matches the features of the non-dialogue. Dialogue is based on tolerance, dignity, inclusion, and I have to add equality. Without those precepts, without those principles, dialogue may begin, but it's doomed for failure. It has to be based on these principles. A dialogue is a discussion not on symptoms, but on root causes, on values and norms. This is frightening. This is daunting for people to deal with because it might change some of the key concepts about themselves and about the other. And therefore, dialogues are rare. Dialogues are open and transparent in nature. And it's an opportunity to collaborate, to create a new social reality, not an opportunity for a clash of narratives. And the focus here is on collaboration, on creating cooperation. In negotiation, all the effort is dedicated to let me explain to you why you see the situation wrongly and my way to look at the situation is the right way. That's the nature of negotiation. And it's exhausting. Dialogue should not be exhausting. It should be flowing. And I want you to pay attention to these two different phases of how to terminate a conflict and create a new situation. Peacemaking, and peace building. These are two different stages. And peacemaking is characterized, is epitomized by negotiation. Peace building is arrived at only after peacemaking is concluded. There is no shortcuts. You cannot jump from conflict directly to peace building. And peace building is epitomized by dialogue. Dialogue cannot happen before peacemaking is over and certainly not around the negotiation table. 
Uli, do you want yes. question, do you want questions to come up as they pertain to the talk or to save for the end? Uh, Shaul, you run the show, so you decide what's more what's more uh, convenient for you guys. No, I guess we'll us we'll wait. To, I guess we'll wait to the end then. But um, this, okay, all I'm right. Making some notes already. <laughs> Great. All right. So, peace building. I want to concentrate on peace building because peace building is the context, is the uh, launching pad for dialogue. So, peace building, as I mentioned earlier, is a bottom up, gradual and fundamental buildup of relationship. Again, no shortcuts, no improvisations here, and no grappling over details. It's not a give and take. This is an important character, it is a very important feature of dialogue, foregoing unity and impose solidarity and celebrate variance and otherness. Because delegations to negotiation always keep the ranks, you know, be together, so have the same message, even though delegations are composed of different people. And I've been uh, a part of, of this experiment for, for, for many times. With regard to dialogue, individuals come in and everybody expresses their own specific and particular and genuine opinion. Sincerity, honesty, and transparency are critical for dialogue. Adopting a perception of a shared future. Negotiation put a lot of weight on the past. Who was there first? Who has more rights? Who is, has more entitlements and legacy and, and tradition and heritage and so on and so forth? They are important. But if we wanna move further from peacemaking to peace building, the orientation is the future. And we have to strive for a common bearable denominator, not ideal. Ideal is a bonus. And it comes later with the buildup of trust. Bearable de denominator is the first achievement, milestone of a dialogue. And as I said before, forget the past, look at the future. Now, it sounds so reasonable, so logical, but folks, you know how difficult that is because each side to every conflict in human history, total human history, always grab for some kind of, uh, or some piece of some chunk of history in order to feel vindicated, in order to have an advantage in this confrontation. In dialogue, we are past this, together with the other who is now our partner, we carve for both sides, a new future. And this is difficult, as I mentioned before, because unlike peacemaking, when we deal with all kinds of technicalities where the uh, forces uh, stay, what is the size of this, where the lines are gonna be drawn, this is what I refer to as technicalities, not undermining them, but just characterizing them. Here, we're talking about much more you know, sensitive issues such as uh, identity, such as honor, such as uh, status. So here's the thing, and this is from my uh, uh, political sociologist hat. Many groups, you know what, most groups, families, communities, nations, cultures, civilizations, and whatever is in between, build, often build their common identity less on what they are and more about what they are not. And for that, they need somebody to contrast themselves with. They need to put someone, another nation, another religion, another culture, another family, another neighbor, to occupy that space in order to demonstrate to themselves and to the people around them why we are better than them. If there is no the other, how can we do that? It's all white on white. There is no contrast. Now in dialogue, we let go of that. In dialogue, that square of the enemy, of the menace, of the you know, the constant threat 
is gone. He is with us in the room. He, she, they, they are our partners. So we need to go in into ourselves in order to ascertain or recreate our common identity. That's very daunting. It takes an effort, takes energy, takes creativity to come up with new resourceful origins for our identity, our sense of purpose, our sense of belonging. And these are really demanding things, but this is what dialogue is potentially doing. It opens doors, it changes the situation and help us change ourselves and our attitude towards the other. Another way to look at it is that peace building, this stage that hosts and give birth to the interaction of dialogue, what we do there is we tackle structural and cultural sources of conflict and violence. What do I mean by that? Well, let me present you with a map of conflict and dialogue. I know lots of arrows, but they're all gonna get meaning immediately. So the first echelon, these are the components of conflict, right? This is the conflict triangle that we met a couple of slides ago. But here is the uh, evolution of that. And this is taken from uh, Johann Galtung, which was uh, the founder, basically considered to be the founder of the um, uh, discipline of peace studies. Of three types of violence, the one leads to the other. The most familiar, the most overt, the manifest type, is to direct violence that we encounter, but not only physical, by the way, not only verbal, but others, other types of it. What types? So here, according to this chart, you see that direct violence is sustained and augmented by cultural violence and structural violence. What are they? Well, structural violence stems from the situation. These are disparities, inequalities that exist in the structure of society. They can be many, socioeconomic, gender, religion, minority, majority, minority, lots of things, foreigners, you name it. You're familiar with the terminology and you live in this country. So these are disparities, inequalities that stem from the actual structure of society, of the political system, of the economic system, whatever is there in the structure, or as we called in the conflict triangle, the situation. The structural violence is upheld and sustained by cultural violence. Cultural violence, in other words, is the, um, I would say the explanation or the justification or the excuse for structural violence. For example, women earn 35% less than men for the same job. That's the structural violence. What's the explanation for that? You know the explanations, but they are considered to be cultural according to Galtung and his school of thought. So cultural violence is composed from all kinds of uh, beliefs, myth mythologies, uh, explanations, stories that uh, people spread from generation to generation that help maintain the structural violence. And both of them lead to direct violence because if you feel that somebody a group, a person is uh, less entitled than you, that somebody else is just an obstacle on your road to achieve your values, you have less inhibitions to engage violently with him, her, or them. Let's continue with the chart. 
So now again, we move from diagnosis to prognosis. If this is the situation, what can we do about it? So he let me open parenthesis. Those who are satisfied with this situation, those that the structural violence play uh, you know, in their favor and they enjoy their status in the society would not continue. They would not be interested in, in, in conflict management. This is the conflict that sustained their privilege and for them, everything is fine. But those who feel disturbed, those who want a new structure, a new situation, which distance itself from conflict into conflict management, they will continue. And here are the three stages that we mentioned before about how conflict management is achieved. Peacekeeping is the immediate stage, lowering the flames, separating the forces, and it deals directly or, or exclusively with direct violence. Peacemaking and peace building, this is the duo that we mentioned before. And peacemaking, again, you see there is a, uh, an arrow from direct violence, is enhancing peacekeeping because we start negotiating about symptoms of how to end the violence. But the most sustained, the long distance stage of conflict management is the peace building because it deals with the root causes, not with the symptoms. And it goes back to the circumstances and conditions of the situation that gave birth to the conflict in the first place and see what each stage is doing. In, keep, in peacekeeping, we just follow directives. We keep the rules. There is no initiative. There is no vision to look beyond the horizon. Just keep the forces separate and lower the flames. Peacemaking is about negotiation and about persuasion, persuading the other side to see things as you see them. And here is our dialogue. Peace building is about dialogue and dialogue is about collaborating to create a new social reality. And to end this and to demonstrate what we're talking about here, here are the components of dialogue. Remember, we're talking about creating a new reality and relating to the other as our partner. Therefore, these are the building blocks of dialogue. Any dialogue between spouses, in the school, in the workplace, between countries, between civilizations and everything in between. Trust, credibility, constructive as opposed to destructive communication. Constructive communication is all about opening all channels. We wanna hear every nuance of the other because we want to minimize the situation of miscommunication, misunderstanding and not to fall back to conflict because of that. We must be creative, dialogue, would not happen by itself. It's not, it's not spontaneous. It has to be systemized. It has to be built on creativity and ingenuity. Interdependence between the two sides because conflict is all about dependency. Sorry, a conflict is all about in, independence. Why? Because we believe that we can solve the problem on our own, that's the independence. The other is not a partner. The other is an obstacle. And therefore, we need to move it. That's the audacity of independence. We can solve it without any dependency on others. But dialogue is all about interdependence. The other is not an obstacle, it is a partner. And if we want to go to a better place, we have to be interdependent on the other. And it takes, and this is the difficult part of it, mental and psychological change of image, of attitude, of opinion. First of our own, we have to treat our own image differently. Second of the other, and third, the most important thing, the relationship between us and the other. And finally, the most important component of dialogue is optimism. Pessimists would not partake in dialogue. Dialogue relies and is cultivated by optimism. 
I want to open it up. Um, uh, the last slides that I have are about my uh, experience in Ramle. And uh, Ramle was one of the projects that we tried to implement a specific type of dialogue called CMM, which is acronym for Coordinated Management of Meaning. And the, the, the gist of it is really creating a new reality together, conjointly, where we leave all our general, generalizations and biases and prejudice outside the room. Very difficult thing to do in, on its own right. And there are various practical and doable models to do that. Uh, as you see here, the daisy model and serpentine model and so on and so forth. I'm going to share with you, um, I, Shaul, everybody's going to get uh, this presentation um, and they can read it on, on their own leisure. But just I want to share with you one of those models. And this is what we did in Ramle. Because the most important thing in dialogue is, as I said, communication. And we need to understand where the other is coming from and to uh, really open the messages that we hear and to understand why they are being said and why they are being said in, in that particular way. And we have to move all our prejudice and all our uh, lenses aside and, and totally be open to them. So here is an example. <clears throat> and this is why we call it the DAISY model. Um, so we started to talking about the delicate situation of Ramle. And in red, these are what the, the, the Jewish participants, we had a core group of 30 participants, uh, half Jewish and half uh, Arabs, Muslims and Christians and, and Bedouins as well. And among the Jews, there were um, seculars and religious, uh, right-wingers, left-wingers, microcosmos of the Israeli society. So in red, these are the Jews participant, the Jewish participants, and in, in blue, the Arab participants. So, for example, I am Jewish, I'm Palestinian, that's self-identity. Uh, we were here first, we were here first. Uh, the Jews uh, took pride in saying that the Ramle is a model mixed down. The Arabs of Ramle were much more hesitant about this. Um, the Jews of Ramla said it's an equal opportunities uh, town. The Arabs were uh, of different opinion. Uh, when we talked about 1948, that was uh, explosive, of course. The Jews looked at it as liberation, the Arabs as occupation. Uh, but the last battle uh, was uh, really uh, reassuring because both were very adamant and, and care a lot about the reputation of the, of the town. They agreed on that. And ultimately, after a couple of months that we had this uh, CMM uh, intervention and workshops and they got to know one another and, and trust began to build, they changed their identity. At first, the questionnaires that we gave them before the intervention began, they identified themselves as far away as possible from the other. I am religious Jew and I'm a Zionist, and the Arabs said, I'm a Muslim, and uh, I um, support uh, freedom movements, uh, um, you know, even some with uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. Bit by bit, as they got to know each other, and we dealt with um, reaching out to the other and, and, and models of understanding, the uh, identity changed. And in the last questionnaire that we gave in the last week, the first parameter, the first criterion that they identified themselves, everybody wrote, I'm a Ramlian. And all the uh, exclusive, uh, exclu mutually exclusive uh, components of the uh, identity uh, were either gone or brought down to third or fourth place. So was, that was an immediate change, an immediate impact. Lastly, before uh, we open it up, these were the indicators of measurable impact that we used in the Ramle uh, project. Change of attitude that we noticed, as I said before, from negative to positive opinions, attitudes, and images of other. Change of identity, exclusive affiliations. We move from exclusive affiliations to shared identity. 
And lastly, in order to test this outside of the room, we ran public activities that were habitually done separately in Ramble, such as excavations. And now after our intervention, they began to uh, administer it collaboratively. So there was an impact. The only drawback is that that project was sponsored by Columbia University and uh, we had to uh, terminate it after six months. Now, no dialogue is happening in a vacuum. So the most important thing I think for dialogue to succeed, to ultimately succeed is consistency. Consistency. It's not a touch and go thing. A dialogue, a genuine dialogue is an ongoing affair. It can be arduous. It can be uh, sometimes exhaustive, sometimes frustrating. One step forward, four backwards, but it has to continue all the time. These are relationships. This is not just an enterprise of a touch and go. And dialogue is not getting into a room with somebody who thinks differently, have a good atmosphere, listen to some music, have some biscuits and drink some tea and then go home. That's not a dialogue. Dialogue is an ongoing and frustrating, but ultimately the only key for real and genuine change. Take it away, Shaul. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so people who've been here before know that um, we're open up, we can open up now the questions. Anything people want to ask, um, ask the people either just write your name in the chat or, or use the raise your hand feature. I also jotted down about six questions, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> we should also be really happy to ask, um, specifically how things are uh, meeting with roots work. But um, let's open up and um, I can. I think Margot has a question, but I'm guessing no. Um, ah, here, Rachel. Uh, Jeffrey wanna... Wilkinson asked that one. Uh, so I'll, you want to you want to read it? Sure. How would Dr. Peleg respond to the concerns of even thinking of Israel Palestine as a conflict, considering the current chasm in terms of power and ability to change the current course? Given the uh, the imperative of, of power between the two sides. Well, those who engage in dialogue, those who plan to engage in dialogue, again, similarly to leaving the biases and the prejudice and the generalizations and categorizations out of the room, this should be left out of the room as well. These are all concepts and dialogue is about changing the reality outside. So when you enter into a room with the purpose of uh, engaging in dialogue, you should relate to the other is on the same par with you, the same par with you. Now, this is a challenge because it seemingly ignores a reality outside, but the purpose is to change a reality outside. So all those who engage in dialogue, they're not doing it to pass the time. They are agents of change. And like ripples in the pond, they should go out after they are done with their session and convince others the dialogue is the way to go in order to have a better reality. Now, if we are all on the same path with regard to dialogue, this minimizes the power disparities. Because power is not a currency in dialogic relationship. And it takes time to win over hearts and mind. But dialogue is the first step to do that. Maybe I'll continue. I think that was Jeff's question. Jess, do you want to add something to follow up with that? Yeah. Sure, that'd be great. Um, thank you. Uh, so the concern I have been working largely with Palestinians, you know, in dialogue and work is that the term conflict for them is a trigger in itself because it implies some form of equanimity. So what I was really hoping Dr. Pellick would talk to is how to overcome that because it we don't even use the word yeah wait a second jeff we didn't hear that part maybe if you okay. keep the video off and say it okay. again though. yeah yeah thank you very much i'm sorry 
That's or I turn it off. So, um, 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 excuse me, I don't know how much you missed, but basically what I was saying in short is in the work that I do with Palestinians and Palestinians in Jewish dialogue is we don't use the word conflict because it's a trigger for Palestinians. So we use struggle, we use other words. And I wondered if you could coach us a little bit on how to overcome that sort of conflict barrier that is a big problem for the Palestinians I work with. Yeah, that's a good question, Jeffrey. Uh, but uh, we don't use it either. When I said conflict, that was uh, with my uh, scholar hat, uh, okay. researcher hat. But when we deal with dialogue, we don't mention it because as, as I said, the key word, the key understanding of dialogue is communication. So what we, what we use is miscommunication or mis, misunderstanding. Uh, because in conflict, there is always, uh, you know, you imply that somebody is to blame, somebody is responsible, somebody brought the conflict more than the other. So we don't get into, the, into those corners. Uh, we talk about communication and constructive communication. Because again, in conflict, it's a destructive communication. You, you deliberately spread noise uh, and fog in the communication channels because you don't want to hear the subtleties and the, uh, the nuances of the other because you're looking for confrontation. Looking for confrontation. Dialogue, you make everything transparency. You, you, you cast out, you, 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 you make the channels of communication as open as possible and you want to get every nuance and in the DAISY model, you try to understand all levels of the message you just received. Why did they say that? You know, in, in dialogue, the most important question is not oh, what. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm you heard the what. I'm fascinated. The question is why. Yes, I know. They had to be. Wait a second. Yeah, you have to be muted. Yeah. Uh, the key question, Jeff, is, is Jeff still with us? Yes. Yes. So I'm the so key, que the quick question in dialogue, I think, is why. Right. The what. I read your articles, I heard you from every podium, I heard you around the table, but I'm curious about the why. In negotiation, people don't, don't delve into the why. What did you say? No, I'm gonna say something else. I'm gonna counter this and back and forth. And the what is ruling. In dialogue, the why is much more important. Why? How did you come up with this? What was the path? What were the scars and the emotions that accompanied you that made this uh, stand opinion? I want to understand it because I want to reach out to you and you to me. So the why is very, very important, but it's, it's sometimes very difficult to get into the uh, origins of the why because it might jeopardize your stance, your convictions. Uh, it's very, you know, we all built ourselves uh, yeah, all those layers, uh, defensive layers, that we are right and uh, we uh, we are the moral side, and uh, all the blame is with them. This is not for dialogue. Again, everything outside. This is David Bohm, one of the greatest minds of of the theory of dialogue. You have to leave everything out. And if we talked about our know, layers of, of of defense, so to continue this this uh, depiction. You enter dialogue naked, um, and you don't have any uh, qualms with that because you trust the other. He, she, they are your partners. You build together things. You don't need those defensive layers on you because you don't feel threatened. Thank you very much. I want to ask the question that um, Dave, you want to ask the question about the structural violence? Yeah. Um, may I speak up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was following along with everything, rah, 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 really doing great. And then as you started to talk about structural, cultural, and direct violence, I, I started to feel resistive and a little bit uh, threatened. It was like, you're saying that all my structures of culture are acts of violence. And I'm thinking if you try to approach it in the same way as using the word conflict, you're going to lose a lot of people. Again, this is part of the research and the scholarly hat. This is Johan. Yeah, Hilton. okay, I understand that now. Yeah, but violence, look, violence is, is derived from violation. Violation of rights, basically. So 
if women get less salary for the same job, this is violation of rights and hence, according to, to Galtum, violence. So violence is much more rampant than just people shooting or hitting each other or cursing each other. Um, and uh, in every society, even in uh, you know, democratic open societies such as the US and Israel, there is structural violence. And what is the explanation? Why do women, why are women paid less? Well, you know, the, the, the explanations, the reasons. You may accept them, you may reject them, but they are the source of the structural violence being intensified and sustained and cultivated further by the cultural violence. That's Galtung. If you accept it or not, you know, it's a narrative, it's an explanation. It's not a possession of the truth by any means, but it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. You know, words have meaning and, and, and that's a, it's a very powerful term, violence. It, yeah. and, and, and that's why I suggested, would it not be perhaps more uh, malleable in the part of the listeners to use a term like restrictions? And may, at least be. at the practical level, I mean, I wouldn't go into a dialogue and say, okay, here's all why your society is so bad and you're all violence. And, and you, 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 end of dialogue no, no. right there. Right, David, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not using it. I, I'm not using okay. it around a, a, dialogue, a dialogue table, absolutely not. No, dialogue is also, you know, uh, eye level. So pre teaching, lecturing, definitely not preaching, you know, it's, it's not usable around dialogue. Uh, you, you should not intimidate people. And if I come with them with a, this is Johan Galtung. No, 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 that's not dialogue at all, no. And Dr. Mule, I wanna, I wanna read, Robin, do you read? I'll read your question here. You wrote it very well, so I'll just, you can read it. I feel it's very well. Um, what, Robin has a PhD in communication. I, Robin, do you wanna read it? I, I, can't, I can't see your face, so it's hard to read. Uh, uh, oh, sure, I'll, I'll read it. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to say, first of all, Dr. Pollard, thank you very much. Um, I have a PhD in communication and I, um, I studied CMM in graduate school. I teach CMM to my students. Really? And so, yes. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> um, Fantastic. So this is a, a presentation that um, it, it's just, it's engaged my soul and my, uh, and my heart and my mind. Uh, so I, I truly, truly appreciate it. And I, I do understand the different languages that you're using in terms of, you know, you're talking about this more research and academically versus how you actually handle the dialogue. My question is specifically, as you talked about, this, this dialogue has to be ongoing. Um, can't, you can't just do a, you can't just assume it's ever gonna end. Uh, and, and you probably know that as researchers, what the, the problem with studying CMM and seeing this kind of, of understanding and dialogue change over time is that we don't often know if the people who are involved in the dialogue are actually giving us real, if they're responding, giving us real information about, yes, my attitude has changed, or are they giving us um, like a Hawthorne effect, they're just telling us what they think we want to know. Because over time, they, you kind of figure out what, you know, what's the goal of this conversation. So I'm wondering, in a situation that is just so critical, I, I really hope that there has been some evidence that the, that the, the dialogue has led to true long-term attitude and behavioral change among the groups that you're working with, rather than something that has just been affected by the facilitators who are there and you know, uh, implicitly suggesting, here's how we want you to see things for right now. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Yeah, what and it's an excellent question, Robin. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to answer because all we are all living in the here and now. Uh, we are manacled by our present. So, uh, and, and for dialogue to really take root and really culminate in an ultimate success, we need the breath of, uh, you know, uh, life experience. Uh, but uh, in baby steps, small baby steps, 
uh, this is exactly why we added the third dimension of impact in Ramla and also in Zanzibar. And in addition to the change of image, the change of opinion, the change of uh, identity, we added the change of behavior. It's one thing to sit in a room and say, okay, you know, I see you differently now. And it's another thing to get out there, out in the open, out in the public, risking the image that you have in the eyes of your brethren or your prospective community and do things together with the previous enemy. This is what we did in Ramle, and this is what we did in, in Zanzibar uh, between populations that previously, um, uh, you know, they had um, uh, abyss of animosity and uh, suspicion, and we, we saw it. Now, it could be that after we left, as I said, no dialogue is, is conducted in, in a vacuum, especially in the, uh, the reality in the state of Israel is so tumultuous, ups and downs, that uh, all those participants, those uh, valiant uh, and pioneer participants were sucked into their prospective communities and dropped the, uh, the new uh, images of the other. Could be, but, um, you know, in the conditions that we had, Columbia University gave us a certain um, budget and they were more interested in, in, uh, in me writing a chapter or writing a book than actual sure. change in the field. You know, it's an academic institution. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what we saw for the time being for the small window of opportunities really was uh, very, uh, very optimistic and very reassuring that uh, we managed to touch their hearts and change their attitudes. We followed up with a couple of diets uh, from that group and uh, three, three diets, three couples remained friends. And uh, a, a one boy and one girl, uh, a Jewish boy and an Arab girl even start dating. Uh, but this is really a challenge. Uh, I don't have to tell you that. Yeah. And, uh, and when we came back for a second round, we had to start from scratch because there were uh, lots of outbursts of, um, of violence uh, in the hiatus that we weren't there. So again, you know, change of opinion, opinions, images are such malleable terms that we had to start again. This is, this is why I stressed uh, consistency okay. as one of the major uh, important critical things in dialogue. And what Roots is doing because of their proximity, because they are neighbors, they can continue their dialogue on an ongoing basis, regardless of the havoc that might erupt uh, any moment around them. And this is why they are such uh, an important organization to look up to. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. I, I, thank you. I'd, I'd like to just, um, yeah. Dr. Pellig, if it's possible, I'd love to be able to contact you um, of course it's possible, yes. Point. Okay, yes, <laughs> thank you yes. very much. I'd love to, to consider, c continue talking about this with you. Thank you. Yeah, same here. So I wanna, there's, so Dr. Pelligan, dialogue circles are people who already want to make change. They're people who are coming together, meaning because your, your dialogue is a constructive dialogue to deal with the conflict. So I'm asking it from Julian, my, my father's question here. Should hearing and accepting the other's story be a prerequisite before the dialogue starts? That's a, an excellent question. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, look, dialogue also has risks because it's, it's an open meeting. You know, um, again, no, no layers of defense, um, no images, no masks, and y everything lays bare. And it can also, um, really revive the uh, notion that the differences are profound and they are genuine. And therefore, I mentioned earlier that uh, we strive for a, a bearable joint future, not ideal. Um, and that means that you accept the narrative of the other, even if you don't agree with a large part of it, because it's an essential 
part of the identity of the other. And you want the other to feel comfortable with you. And if their narrative, part of it at least, is part of them being secure and comfortable, you don't grapple with it. You accept it. You are not there to change the narrative of the other, but to accept it. Inclusion is also a very important process of it. And dialogue is not being done by two identical sides that agree uh, on every part and every word. If that had been the situation, dialogue was unnecessary, would have been unnecessary. So yes, and I, and I told you uh, before that uh, dialogue is, could be, at least at the early stages, a very intimidating process. But if the other option is to continue the conflict until kingdom come, I'll take the risk of dialogue. And again, you don't force people to get into dialogue. If they feel comfortable, if they feel that the current situation, the confrontation, they can survive the confrontation or even win the confrontation, you won't find them in a dialogue incident, in a dialogue of, uh, engagement. So you so, need really people who are, as I said, optimists and that believe that dialogue can lead them to a better reality than the one that they are familiar with. I think that's a great segue into to Saskia's question here. Saskia, do you want to ask it? Or, um, Saskia is here? So she. Hi, yes. Muli, how are you? Hi, Saskia, how are you? I'm in the car, so yes. uh, so nice to yes. see you and again, Saskia, as always. Right. So amazing to hear you speak, as always. <laughs> So my question to you is how important is accountability in dialogue? And we obviously know that, you know, narratives comes first and foremost, but when in that process comes the um, fact of really bringing account accountability on both sides? That's it? Okay. Now accountability, yep. it, it, <laughs> uh, accountability is imperative, but I have to, I have to uh, point out that there is no problem with accountability in, a go, in, uh, in dialogue. The, the problem of accountability um, is, is, uh, is discerned uh, during negotiation. Negotiation is all about uh, arm wrestling and uh, who's going to win the negotiation, who's going to outwit uh, the other, uh, who's going to you know, uh, put the other into shame. That's negotiation. That's peacemaking. In dialogue, we have made the uh, transition that we, are, we have a, a different mindset and accountability is already there because we try to uh, ascertain and build this accountability mechanism on the road from the negotiation to dialogue, from peacemaking to peace building. So peace building by now we already managed to uh, build the trust in the arduous and frustrating and extended process of negotiation. This is why I emphasize that there is no shortcuts. It cannot be a jump from conflict to peace building. It has to be a peacemaking stage, which is, is very long, very arduous. And by then you get to know the other and you, you, you build the accountability in the preceding stage. So once you enter dialogue, people enter without preconceived notions, but with accountability and trust of the other. I, have a, I wanted to ask a question about um, this moment when we're living in a conflict, people go from a place of living in the conflict to make the decision to get into managing the conflict, to making the change. And um, if you have, if you have kind of insights about what are the, do you have, in the research, have you identified how you call the different processes? What, what are the things that that motivation takes place? What's the shift that happens there? Um, the motivation, you're talking about the motivation, Shao? In the shift between people who are living in a conflict, like we all are, living these structures that there are today, and what are the kinds of things that spark the, 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 wanted, the wanting to enter a space of dialogue, the wanting to engage? Um, I just so, wonder if, if you have research that goes zeroing in on that, those phenomena, that, 
that the expansion Well, I have to, uh, again, one of the misconceptions of dialogue that people are doing it mainly for, uh, for altruist reasons. That's, as I understand it, it's totally wrong. Uh, people have interests and interests motivate people. Conflict is motivated by interest, but also conflict management is motivated by interest and certainly dialogue. And the, the, the decision to get into dialogue which uh, you know encompasses all the things that I've mentioned, mainly to see the other as your partner rather than your enemy. Manage to, uh, including self-image, you don't have all the justice and all uh, the truth in your in your side, and uh, there is no clash of uh, truth versus uh, versus wrong, but clash of two narratives. That's a very difficult. Uh, decision to make because people get comfortable with the truth. You get into dialogue because you understand that it serves your purpose and your interests that you'll be better off around the dialogue table than uh, butting heads in, in the conflict or in the negotiation table. It's your own decision. You don't give up on your own interests, on your own schedule, on your own priorities. But your effort is shifted to see how your priorities merge with the priorities of the other in order to create a new set of priorities. The result is more than the parts in dialogue. And it takes a real process of adjustment. It's not a natural process show. It's not a natural process. Dialogue, that's a negotiation is a meeting between talkers. Dialogue is a meeting between listeners. You have to listen much more than you talk and express your opinion. You have to be very sensitive and attuned to the nuances of the other. And it also, Bill, it, it is founded on reciprocity. It cannot one be. of the things we've seen at Roots, which I think which I'd also like to hear your opinion about, is dialogue and negotiation are both front-to-front -front people speaking. But I think there's a lot of other actions that we take that can spark the people to, uh, to get out of the zero-sum game, if I just kind of boil down what you're just saying. People said at some point, it's, even though we're right, there's a reason we should talk to them. Even though our story is better, <laughs> there's, a, there's some kind of motivation. And I think... For us at Roots, I found it's a lot of times it's the actions, that, it's the actions of the Palestinians that Israelis or the actions that Israelis do that the Palestinians see that kind of give the spark. And I wonder if that's another field to, I think, to another aspect of the of the work here, of peace building. Um, it's not in it's not in the words we say. It's in the it's in finding the the, the, the images we can present to challenge the other side's zero sum game. Um, and, it, and I think also those are effective because they reach well beyond the people who. Are in that mindset already that comes into the into the dialogue room. They have the ability to kind of transmit and show up in society in different ways. That, um, that I, I think that's one of the things Roots at this point is is keenly after, is asking the questions. Well, what is the thing that the Palestinian society does that challenges Israelis' conceptions of them, and vice right. versa? What are the you know, and how do we broadcast that at, into our local communities here? Yeah, you're right. I mean, dialogue is not a feel-good exercise. It, it can be painful, it's exposing things, it's raising up things. As I said, we're going to the root causes, not only symptoms, as dialogue is not about being nice, it's about being genuine. You know, there was one moment, one enchanted moment, child, when, when you hosted me there at your, at, at your gathering place and prayer time arrived. And I was the only one left there because I'm, you know, I'm secular. And, but I watched you guys, and the, the Jews went to one side and prayed one direction, and the Muslims went to the other side of, and prayed to the other direction, and everybody came and you mingled. So you don't give up on the self. The self remained there, very, very strongly so. You don't want to lose yourselves in the crowd. That's not going to be a real dialogue. Then you came back. And everybody hugged everybody else. I was in tears, man. It was so powerful. It was just the gist 
of an authentic dialogue there. But dialogue is not all about, I'm telling you, it's not about hugging and drinking tea together and, and feel good about it and then go tell the guys that I've been to a dialogue event. That's not it. It's excruciating, but it's the right direction. It's the only right direction to terminate conflict and create a new reality that is good for everybody else. So Muli, thank you so much. I think I've, we're technically at, a, at an hour and 15, which is when we, everybody's free to go when they need to. Um, but I want to thank you. And um, thank you for reflecting. It's always great being in the field and hearing f from the people who are thinking and, you know, and processing and looking at the scope and uh, reflecting back. Give me a lot of questions. I'll send you fast on. And uh, I imagine if you want to put your email in the chat, if anybody wants to follow up, pretty friendly yeah. crowd here. If anybody's yeah. interested in, in following up on personal questions. Um, yes. And so there is a there is a recording, so uh, you can uh, you can send the uh, presentation to everybody who wants. That's great. Yeah, well, the recording, of course, will go up on the archive, and everybody here doesn't know there's an archive of all the past presentations. Everybody's welcome to uh, to check in there. Um, and I say again, we had a, an amazing event today. It was really incredibly inspiring to see the the 60 years at the closing circle, and um, I'll send, we'll send some pictures up on the Friends of Roots on the Facebook. But um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to share to, to donate or to share the to share. Um, with what's going on. We have actually a pretty, I met some of the young people there, the Israelis and Palestinians that are the 20 somethings that are in our new group in the Jordan Valley. And it's uh, it's a really exciting group because they're exactly like you're saying, they're, they're in this place, this living, they're living the conflict and they decided they want to make that change and engage. And there's some really, any anybody wants to share that, is posted the link there, feel free to share amongst your friends. Um, we have another week of the campaign. And um, thank you. I'm gonna, if everybody's, going to still hang out and we can, can, can do small chat in the in our little room here. Um, and otherwise, I'm going to say good night or good morning or good afternoon or good evening to all our respective time zones. And uh, to Dr. Pelik for sharing. Uh, thanks for everybody coming out tonight. Thank you. Be well, be healthy, stay healthy. Stay healthy. <laughs> Joel, are the archives, are they all listed there or only selected 